Hello and welcome to another FormFast educational webinar. I'm Aaron Voss, Director of Marketing at FormFast, and I'll be your host today. In case you're new to the webinar series, we provide educational content about topics we feel like are in part important to our healthcare audience. We invite you to join us for the entire webinar series and to visit our website at www.formfast.com webcast to watch recordings of previous sessions. Today's session is especially exciting as we're joined by industry thought leader, Dr. Charles Webster. He'll be discussing the need for workflow automation in healthcare, which we feel like is an important topic to bring to light. We'll also be joined by solution architect, Sean Curtis, who will share some of the ways that FormFast is using workflow technology to automate hospital processes. But before we proceed, I wanna take a moment to review the WebEx interface. Note that the audio from today's session will be broadcast through your computer speakers. Uh, please make sure that uh, you have your computer speakers uh, on, uh, on mute, otherwise you may hear uh, an echo. If you are experiencing audio difficulties, please contact the host, myself, via the chat window so that we can work with you to restore the audio connection. Also note that the uh, question and answer portion of the session will be at the end of the presentations today. We do encourage you though to submit questions through the Q&A section and the chat window on the right side of the interface at any time during the presentations. And for those of you who are new to, uh, to FormFast and to this webinar series, I wanna give you a brief bit of information about who we are. Uh, we provide automation solutions for healthcare, including electronic forms management or e-forms. Workflow automation is part of what we provide. Uh, dashboards and reporting is part of the solution set, as well as electronic document storage or ECM solutions. And finally, output management. We're proud to serve over 1,000 hospital clients internationally, as well as being number one in e-forms management in healthcare. Plus, we've been in business for over 20 years, uh, providing solutions for hospitals. Now, at this time, I'd like to introduce today's featured presenter, Dr. Charles Webster. Charles, or Chuck, as he's often called, is a prolific thought leader in the health IT community. He was listed as one of the top 10 HIT bloggers to follow on Twitter by Healthcare IT News, and was a top influencer in social media at this year's HIMSS conference. You can follow him on Twitter at at EHR Workflow, or you can read his blog at chuckwebster.com. With degrees in accountancy, industrial engineering, computational linguistics, artificial intelligence, and medicine, Dr. Webster has unique insights into how healthcare can be improved. He's noted for designing the first undergraduate program in medical informatics and for writing the first three award-winning case studies submitted for the HIMSS Davies Award for EHR Ambulatory Excellence. Chuck is a strong proponent for BPM and workflow solutions, and today he'll be sharing his insights about those technologies and how they can be used in a healthcare environment. So Chuck, at this time, I'd like to turn the presentation over to you. And thank you, I see my slides, excellent. Uh, well, thank you for that uh, introduction. Uh, are you hearing me at that end, and I presume out there as well? That sounds great. Great, um, good introduction, and thank you to everybody who's attending uh, this session called The Power of Process, Workflow Automation, Business Process Management, and uh, Healthcare. I'll uh, give a little background. I will argue that healthcare needs business process management. I will compare healthcare to other industries. I will uh, look at a couple of use cases, both at the point of care, at not at the point of care, and then I'll talk about next steps after the, uh, the webinar. I could read my bio, but it'd be really boring, so I'm going to just say it is boring, but a Venn diagram, especially a colorful one, is more interesting. So I've got these four degrees. Uh, I was pre-med uh, accountancy major, uh, eventually went to medical school. I also have masters in industrial engineering and artificial intelligence uh, with some focus in computational linguistics and uh, cognitive science. Okay, uh, I, I have a bunch of websites, a bunch of content out there, mostly educational uh, in nature and news, 
I'm trying to build a community of people who are interested in what the academics call process-aware information systems, information systems that actually represent and understand and reason and can improve processes automatically or semi-automatically. Uh, you've probably seen this big wave and you've heard the phrase big data. Uh, this is actually an animation. It's a series of slides, so it's not quite as smooth, uh, but you can imagine that wave is moving. And I will argue that close on the heels of big data is something I call big workflow. Now, what do I mean by big workflow? Well, about 10 years ago, I wrote a white paper on healthcare workflow that's been number one in Google uh, at the top of the first page uh, almost uh, for 10 years. And I used a phrase there, which is the workflow of workflow. Well, if you ever think of data about data, that's metadata. Thinking about thinking, that's metacognition. Well, workflow about workflow is, is meta workflow, but I like workflow of workflow better as a phrase. So let's start with the definition of workflow. I've looked at hundreds, and this is my distilled definition. It is simply a series of steps consuming resources that achieve a goal. I've seen simpler definitions, like series of steps, and I have seen many much more complicated uh, definitions, but we're gonna work with this one. Here's a visual representation of workflow. We have a series of states, transitions between those states, that's a workflow, and that achieves the goal of whatever. Now, let's think about improving that workflow. Well, that's a workflow too. The workflow of workflow is improving workflow. So to get from workflow to better workflow and to even better workflow is a series of steps. And obviously one wants to create a virtuous cycle in which you're improving all aspects of workflow, both uh, reducing errors, reducing variability, increasing speed, reducing cycle time, the amount of time it takes to get from the beginning to an end of a workflow. And if you do that, you usually can increase volume of transactions and you're trying to hit that goal, hit that target, and do it with the least amount of resources. My wife, right about now, says, Chuck, cat, dog, tree. It's all very zen. I realized after a while what she meant was, what is the simplest set of simple ideas that can only fit together in one way that achieves my goal or communicates my point? And so I'm going to try to cat, dog, tree, workflow, and the workflow, workflow. And I kind of like the way the question marks are over this dog, because he's wondering how things are going to turn out. Well, I think most of us stereotypically would know that this is the way it's going to turn out. The cat's up the tree, the dog's at the base of the tree. Well, I'm going to turn cat, dog, tree into a verb, and I'm going to cat, dog, tree, workflow. Engine, that's what the thing that does the work. In the real world, this is a Corvette engine. It does a lot of physical work. In the software world, workflow engines do work for users. They do digital work. Well, how do they know what to do? How do they know which task to hand to which person or which data to download from which database automatically without requiring anybody to click on anything? Well, they follow a definition, a workflow definition. Down at the bottom here, we have the definition of definition, speaking of meta. This is from the 1755 Dictionary of the English Language. Uh, it was the first one uh, of, of a comprehensive nature by Samuel Johnson, and he described the definition as a short descri description of a thing by its properties. Well, you can describe workflow as a list of steps and a list of resources that are consumed and a goal that is achieved. Well, where does that definition come from? It comes it, traditionally from a human, someone who understands the work domain. Here we have the, the harried editor. And that person understands the domain, they create this process model, a model of the workflow, and then that is fed to the, to the machine, to the engine, to execute. While it is being executed, things are being tweaked. You're observing, you're, you're adjusting the carburetor. If it runs out of gas, you put gas in. So there's a kind of a real-time management of the workflow system as well. Well, what that definition is, and this is an actual simplified definition uh, of, in an, of a patient uh, encounter. So here we have a set of screens. The screens are popping up automatically, and a nurse is going to collect some vitals information, enter that into a screen either by touching things or using speech recognition. 
And then there's a sequence of screens to, well, uh, are you on any new meds recently? Should I take any off the list? How about allergies? What are you allergic to? And then down here in the blue roll, we have a physician may conduct several steps, such as doing an exam and then making a, a, an assessment and, uh, and, and ordering some treatment, such as a prescription that will be sent someplace. And then there's this iterative set down here in which you try to get the money from the insurance company. Well, someone who understands the patient encounter can model that, can create a description of it, and that can be executed by the workflow engine putting the right screens in front of the right person so that they don't have to click a lot. A lot of folks complain about clickorea by analogy to diarrhea, too much clicking. Plus, it can accomplish things automatically in the background, saving a lot of time. And of course, it's consistent because it's a computer. But the really cool thing from the point of view of meta workflow, the workflow of workflow, big workflow, is while that engine is working, it is generating immense amounts of timestamp data. So up here at the top, we see that 85% of the uh, time, the nurse, and I'm going to bring up my little uh, cursor here. 85% yeah, 80 of the time, the nurse chooses to go collect meds and allergy through the template. But 15% of the time, she goes over and uses speech recognition to generate a note. And then down here, it converges. You can use this information along with the time of eight minutes between vitals in the note to spot bottlenecks and go and ask the nurse, well, why did you take so long and why did you do it this way? And she can explain and you can then change the workflow. Okay, that's workflow. Well, what is business process management? Well, the BPM industry evolved out of the workflow management systems industry. And for a long time, people said, oh, that's just old wine and new bottles. It's workflow with a whole bunch of adjectives, like transparent, agile, that sort of thing. But in fact, the way I think of it is that harried human editor, how about you give that human all kinds of great tools to improve the workflow, either after the fact or to monitor the workflow. That's called business activity monitoring. And by the way, that computer right there, that's the Altair 8800, it is the first PC, it ignited the PC revolution, and it was invented and developed and sold by a pediatrician. I just love to find those connections between the IT and the medical side. Okay, back to workflow of workflow. If you look up business process management in Wikipedia, there's a phrase there, which is process optimization process. Again, it sounds meta. The process of optimizing a process. It kind of should remind you of that diagram I showed you of the workflow of workflow, the steps between bad workflow to good workflow. Well, business process management has a life cycle. Here we have design, model, execute, monitor, optimize. Should be similar to what I just described. Design and model, that's creating the process definition, the process model. Execute it, that's what the workflow engine or the orchestration engine or the process engine does. They, those are approximate synonyms. Then you've got monitoring. So while it's executing, if there's an exception, if it falls off the happy path, you want a human to intercede and fix the problem. And then optimization. All this data that gets generated can be fed back into reducing cycle time, increasing throughput, decreasing errors, increasing the accuracy with which the goal is achieved, and achieving the same amount of work with fewer resources. If that cycle reminds you of something called PDCA, plan, do, check, act, or adjust, it should. It's software-based PDCA. So much of work today in healthcare is being mediated. It is being in, it's actually in the software. And so if you want to improve that work and that workflow, why not use the software to do it? This is uh, the last non-healthcare slide. Uh, just to give you a sense of perspective, the global BPM market is about three billion, and it's heading to about seven billion over the next four years, and it's growing at about 18% a year. Just to give you a sense of perspective, uh, the health IT market is about a magnitude greater about 8 to, to 12 or 13 times as big, depending on which year you are looking at in this projection, and it's growing at a rate of about 7%. I strongly believe, and I have been arguing for a decade, 
with increasing success, mind you, that healthcare needs business process management. Why? The IOM Institute of Medicine estimates that the U.S. wastes more than $760 billion a year, one-third of the total $2.5-plus trillion healthcare economy. So I recently went out – oh, that's the next slide – I, why does the IOM think that this is the, the, the problem? What, what's causing this waste? Unnecessary services, medical errors, uncoordinated care, uh, uh, excessive variation, fraud. There's a great variety here, such a variety. What do all of these have in common? They all have in common workflow. They are complicated workflows, complicated processes, complicated series of steps consuming resources, and achieving goals or maybe in some cases not achieving goals. If we modeled more of those and we executed those models and we generated the big data necessary to improve those workflows, we could go a long way to reduce the amount of waste in healthcare. So I went and I found the world's expert on workflow technology. He's Will Vanderals, he's in the Netherlands, he's written over 200 papers, chapters, three or four books, and about 20 or 30 of his articles are about healthcare. He's very interested in healthcare. And he estimates, back of the envelope calculation, mind you, that the U.S. could save as much as $600 billion if we fully adopted process aware information technology, which is what the academics call business process management. I think it's worth reading this quote. We, the BPM researchers, have a particular interest in healthcare because processes are much more chaotic than in other industries, and potential savings are enormous. Healthcare is very challenging, very challenging, and therefore a very interesting application domain. All right, slight change of gear. If you're in health IT, you know that doctors are complaining about EHR usability. Here are some example headlines. Satisfaction is falling. Usability is a bigger issue. We need more user-friendly EHRs. We've got a long way to go. And editorials that vendors must solve these usability issues. Well, guess what? These usability issues of EHRs is just the tip of the iceberg. Both EHRs and non-EHR health IT systems have massive problems with effectiveness, efficiency, and user satisfaction. What's so interesting about those three qualities is they are the international standards organization's definition of usability. Usable products and services are effective, efficient, and they make their users, whether they're someone clicking on a screen or a patient someplace, happy. Compare that definition to the A definition of business process management. It is a systematic approach to making an organization's workflow more effective, more efficient, and more capable of adapting to an ever-changing environment. Effectiveness, effective. Efficiency, efficient. User satisfaction. I would argue that the single biggest problem with user dissatisfaction with current health IT systems is that they are not capable of adapting and customizing workflow to their local preferences and needs and to do so over time to change as the regulatory environment and the, as the business needs change. Now, I imagine we may have some healthcare process improvement folks out there. And so what is the relationship between BPM and healthcare process improvement? Back when I got my master's in industrial engineering, the management, en management engineers that worked in hospitals and, and elsewhere, they were involved in both sides of an equation. They were creating and implementing many of the first information systems. I worked in a hospital MIS department where the payroll system had been developed and implemented and managed by a management engineer, an industrial engineer. But then what happened is a bunch of folks went off and they started developing electronic health records and other health IT systems, and you've got this research behind it, which is medical informatics. And I don't think they spent enough energy and time thinking about workflow problems and workflow theories and creating workflow tools. Meanwhile, over on the other side, we've got the total quality management folks, Six Sigma and Lean. They're 
finding the causes of errors. They're finding the sources of variation and eliminating it. They're figuring how to do the same amount of work but with less waste. Well, the problem is, is that more and more work is actually done in a kind of a mind meld with the software. And so we really need to knit together these two traditions. And I think that the healthcare business process management uh, hybrid is a way to do that. I go to many health IT and business process management conferences, and I have seen many impressive uh, case studies. Insurance, banking, manufacturing, energy, hospitality, transportation, trade associations. Where's healthcare? Well, until recently, it's not been present a lot, but it is showing up, and those case studies are very impressive. I've written about them, uh, and I have descriptions of a variety on my blog. And healthcare is catching up. So there was a survey recently of, health, of, of IT professionals asking which vertical they were in, which industry they were in, and whether they were using B, uh, business process management or not. 6% in healthcare were using BPM. Most of these systems are in the back room. They're used for human resources and for healthcare insurance, but that's moving out of the back room as people see the potential for this kind of technology closer and closer to the point of care. And in fact, almost 20% plan future investment. And I think that uh, percentage is actually going to be much higher. Okay, healthcare. Healthcare is like a very large insular company, country that's been closed off from the rest of the world for a long time. But now it's opening up. And the same forces that are affecting many other verticals, such as social, mobile, analytics, and cloud, particularly, are also affecting healthcare. These technologies and these new industries, if you look under the hood, often the most successful platforms have workflow automation, workflow engines, the ability to draw out a workflow or to systematically improve that workflow with the data, possibly big data. And that is essentially kind of like an epidemiological vector. It is bringing into healthcare workflow automation, which is not to say that workflow automation hasn't always existed in healthcare. However, it's not been widely prevalent or appreciated or understood, but I think the profile is dramatically rising because of this confluence of these internally developed workflow automation systems and the ones that are being brought in by the, uh, the social, mobile, and analytics uh, cloud platforms. So, point of care workflow automation. Let's look at a use case. What is a use case? Well, in Wiki, it says, a use case is a list of steps defining interactions between a role, such as a physician or a nurse or someone in the health records department, and a system, such as an information system, to achieve a goal. That sounds kind of familiar to me. Sounds a lot like my definition. A workflow is a series of steps, consuming resources, which I think is implied by the use case, to achieve a goal. The difference is the use case is a list of steps, whereas workflow is, is the steps themselves. Well, what about a workflow definition? A definition is a short description of a thing by its properties. The most essential definition of workflow is the list of steps. So a use case and a workflow definition are approximately similar to each other, and that's part of the secret to the sauce. The fact that a use case could be a drawing of stick figures interacting with a system over time, or a pseudo-English description, but it's also a workflow definition which can be executed and improved uh, by a computer. Here's a classic looking workflow editor. If you've ever used uh, Visio from uh, my, uh, Microsoft, it looks kind of familiar. Uh, I've drew, drawn this kind of thing. I've been in a boardroom where all four walls were covered by butcher paper and it was covered with Sharpie uh, pen written workflows. The problem with those kinds of workflows is after you have it, you have a pretty picture, but you can't turn around, turn a crank, and turn it into a computer program. Now, uh, in this case, just to uh, ground it a little bit on the clinical side, we've got a patient coming in and they have had a possible cerebrovascular accident. And these decision points, the little yellow uh, diagonals, 
are decisions that have to be made. Do we should we check uh, the neurological status? Is this a thrombolysis candidate? Uh, have we confirmed that there was an accident? What about hemorrhage and then a decision? And these little icons here, nurse, physician, and so forth, are dragged and dropped to create it. Now, I want to compare that classic workflow editor with a simpler workflow editor. In this scene, it does, it's slide, it doesn't look that simple, but it will look simpler in a moment. You can think of a health information system, or in this case, an electronic health record, as a set of screens, but also the little dotted lines, those are screenless tasks. And these screens allow users to review data from previous uh, patient encounters, to enter more data that will be useful in making decisions at later points, as well as order entry screens in which assessments and diagnoses uh, and, tre and treatments, uh, such as things that will send prescriptions off to through SureScripts are. Now, the screenless tasks are also saving a lot of time and effort and money and user dissatisfaction. They're automatically going to see if there are clinical labs and downloading them and then putting a list, uh, an item in a work list. They're printing educational materials at the printer that's closest to the person who's responsible for the patient. They're creating automatic reminders based on schedules interacting with uh, business rules or clinical decision rules. So that obviously saves a lot of time and effort. Well, where did it come from, the, the, this workflow that I'm talking about? Well, we're going to grab a bunch of those, and we're going to create a workflow. Over on the left-hand side, we have, it's only eight steps. Uh, a typical encounter might be 20 steps. But the, uh, we will see what these are because we can look at the pick list that represents the workflow. We have uh, get patient, so the nurse walks into the room, says, I am bringing John Doe into room C. And then the next couple of screens pop up automatically. The nurse doesn't have to go and navigate some complicated and clumsy uh, menu hierarchy. We're going to uh, collect some vital signs, ask about allergies, ask about medications. We're going to uh, conduct a review assistance, and that review assistance will be the right one based on whether it's a child or an adult, uh, whether that nurse likes, has a favorite review assistance, or it may be based on the physician that nurse works for, and different specialists have different review assistants. And so these systems can be very parameterized so that at, the, at each point in, of step in execution, they do the right thing. And so finally, you get down to the billing steps. And I will skip ahead. By the way, there's something I call the litmus test for frozen workflow. After you see the demo of a system, say, I'd like to see that demo again, except I want you to make one change. I want you to bring up something that will allow you to edit the workflow. It might look like that old-fashioned workflow editor with all the, you know, the, the arrows and diagonal boxes, or it might look like this, or it might look like something else. And what I want you to do is go in there and change one thing. Delete a step, change the order of a step, and then I want you to go and do the demo again. And, I, and, and if that system has an actual workflow engine that is consulting some kind of representation of, of workflow, it will do what you would expect it would do if it's executing that recently edited model. So in this case, it should skip the step of uh, checking for allergies, asking the nurse, uh, have, ask the patient about allergies. Okay, let's look at a non-point of care workflow automation example. Here is a uh, a drag-and-drop hospital workflow definition editor, and up here at the top is the beginning of the workflow, down at the bottom is the, at the end. This kind of is like a cross between those two previous ones that we just looked at. And uh, it's going to be, okay, we want to drag-and-drop, we want to create a step, which is to go and get a signature from someone. And then when that happens, we want to forward it to a role or a group. So anybody can look on this list of available tasks, it's kind of a pooling concept from computers, and, and grab it and say, yes, quality assurance, everything has been, you know, done that I think should be done. And then even the manager gets, we have two levels of quality assurance. So everything goes through the manager. And then finally, we see down here, there's like a little icon of a person and an arrow and going back to a question mark. We want to close the loop. We want to send back information to the person who ordered this workflow to say it was successfully accomplished. But this is just a skeleton of a workflow. We want to go in and customize these steps further. So let's say we want to go to the manager step, and we want to give them an option to uh, add a little note. So we've got the little pen symbol. Now suppose we want to make sure that every time that happens, an email gets sent to maybe this is, the, this is, a, uh, this is not the ultimate manager. Maybe they're, they're filling in for someone, or it needs to be copied to the other people who are also have managing roles that are uh, rotating uh, through this department. 
Well, now we have the executable process model. It's a process model, it's a process definition, it's a workflow definition. I'm using these uh, so you get familiar with the, the terminology, which can vary. And then the workflow engine looks at it and says, okay, I need to send a, a to-do item to this person. When they click on it, it's gonna pull up this form. It might be on a tablet as they're uh, wandering around the hospital. Then I want to forward the results of that into some pool where other people will grab it and do something with it. Uh, it needs, ultimately, everything, the manager has to sign off on everything because uh, in this place, they have two levels of quality assurance. And finally, we want whoever initiated this needs to know that it was done. So we're closing the loop. All right, now. Uh, in, uh, I, I, there's, don't have enough time. Uh, this is a this is a cat dog tree uh, version of business process management. Uh, but uh, I do I did want to pull out uh, an example number from a from a case study. Uh, and so uh, there was a paper manual process for creating generating the patient admissions packet in a hospital. It cost two dollars and forty cents. It was estimated. And then after the workflow was automated using a workflow engine and process definition and so forth, the cost per packet dropped to 45 cents. This is on the order of increase in productivity of three or four hundred percent. I've seen this before. And what's fascinating is I have seen many manual paper processes automated that did not use workflow automation, did not use true workflow automation with the workflow engine doing all that work. And guess what? Those end up reducing productivity. People have to click a lot because if there is no workflow engine in the computer, the human has to do all that work and they got to click, click, click and they complain about that. Other things, uh, the other dimensions of increased productivity are things like if you greatly reduce the cycle time. So if all the steps are, are not having to wait around for someone to pick up the baton and move it to the next person, well, it's going to happen more quickly. And so when you get a shorter cycle time, you get higher throughput. And for the given amount of resources, you're going to be able to scale up or you're going to be able to achieve the same amount with reduced resources. All right. If, I, if my uh, enthusiasm or, and my animations and uh, this data has convinced you, eh, maybe I ought to investigate this further, this is my workflow of, uh, of what, where to go. You might call it meta-meta workflow, uh, the workflow of workflow of workflow. And so we're learning right now. That's what we're doing right here. Well, you kind of, this is called a split, by the way, and it is a, uh, it is a so both of these happen in parallel. And you look at your environment and you say, well, what are the high value workflows? What are the things, and we'll, on the next slide, we'll talk about what is a high value workflow. And, we'll, and those workflows, the details about those workflows will inform you about a set of requirements so that you can compare workflow products or workflow platforms or vendors. Let's look at workflow value. Workflow value is a function of a number of users. The more users that are use it, well, then the more valuable it's going to be, more happy people, the greatest good for the greatest uh, many. The more frequently the workflow is executed, the more value it will be. It will be. If, it's, if it's executed every 15 minutes, it's going to be a lot more valuable than if it's executed every couple of weeks. The financial value is important. Is there something writing a check at the end of the successful workflow? And then finally, the difference between uh, a better workflow in the current painful workflow, the current ineffective, inefficient, and unhappy user workflow, the bigger that is, the more the workflow value is going to be. Okay, well once you've done that, you need to winnow down those workflows a little bit further. And what you need to do, because you need to walk before you run, you need to say, well what are the low complexity workflows? What are the workflows that would be easiest to accomplish? Because a lot of people are gonna be watching and you want to plan for success. And so you want to do the thing that is going to give you the biggest bang for the buck, and then people are going to line up because of the latent demand for fixing workflow problems. What is workflow complexity? It is also the number of users because users are different. So you have a, a lot of users and they're all different. Well, guess what? That causes complexity. Now you've got the number of steps. The more steps that you have to model and to execute, the more complicated the workflow definition, the more complicated the executable process model will be. 
the more other systems that the system has to touch, the emails that need to be sent automatically, the data that needs to be downloaded from a clinical laboratory, or the prescription that needs to be sent someplace, or the database in the medical records department uh, that has uh, patient demographics and forms uh, content, the more complicated the workflow is going to be. And then finally, the more logically complex the decision making and the problem solving across that workflow, the more complicated the workflow. So uh, the simpler the decision making, the more likely you can uh, create an if-then rule someplace, some business rule. Uh, the more lo complicated, the more you're going to require human uh, intervention, and, that's, and that equals complexity. Okay. So you, you scan your environment and you say, here's all the workflows. You grade them according to high value versus low value, low complexity versus high complexity. And while you probably don't want to bother with low value anything, low value, low complexity, low value, certainly not low value, high complexity, but you want to start with a success because people are watching. And so you choose that. And when you're successful, you then start to move up into more complex but also higher value. And now we finally made it down to, you know, actually tackling that workflow. Well, where, what, what, where is the knowledge that is going to make you successful? Well, business process management, especially in healthcare, and workflow automation, workflow management systems technology, case management systems, uh, uh, that ter that, the terminology hasn't yet been standardized, and the best practices have not been standardized. And so you kind of need to go native with the vendor. The vendor has a track record of success. They know what works. Uh, they're invested in your success. And so you need to, you know, t spend the amount of time. They think you need to spend an amount of on, on training and so forth and so on. In a sense, you've got to pick the right Kool-Aid, and then you've got to drink that Kool-Aid. you kind of got to go native in order to bring the workflow mindset, the workflow culture from the vendor over into uh, your organization. Okay, we're closing here. Uh, and I just want to show that big data slide. Uh, we've got this wave, and it's in the headlines, but I am firmly convinced that even more important than big data is big workflow. And big workflow requires big data. It requires the data necessary to systematically improve workflow based on analytics that are hooked to things like cycle time, throughput, uh, pa patient safety, and so forth and so on. Uh, and I'm very, very cheerful and optimistic about more and more of this kind of technology, workflow engines, process definitions, workflow management systems, workflow automation, business process management, case management, these are all kind of um, mixed together in amalgam. Uh, I call it healthcare business process management. Now, some people have a problem with the word business in healthcare, and so you'll also sometimes see healthcare process management or care process management. But if you drill down and you look in the footnotes, you'll typically see workflow engines, models, executable models of, uh, of, of work. Um, and uh, I've created a, uh, a website at hcbpm, healthcarebusinessprocessmanagement.com. Hope you'll stop by. Uh, I've got lots of content there and links off to case studies and so forth. Uh, one more thing. I'm, I love hearing workflow success stories regardless of whether they involve workflow engines or not. And so I've created a directory on my kind of my Twitter accounts uh, uh, website, which is at ehrworkflow.com, POWHIT, P-O-W-H-I-T, the link's on the next slide too. POWHIT, that stands for People and Organizations Improving Workflow with Health Information Technology. POW HIT is kind of like those call-outs that you'd see during a fisticuff scene in the old Batman series, just trying to give it a little uh, zip. Okay, finally, we've come to uh, the end here. I think we'll probably be holding questions until after Sean uh, has his chance to present. I do want to mention, again, my blog, ChuckWebster.com, my Twitter account. I'm, I think I'm pretty interactive. Uh, and I want to thank the folks down here at the bottom, uh, Brown Selassie, who I believe is in the Middle East or Africa, uh, Professor BPM in the Netherlands, uh, 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 Lucas Ryan, uh, uh, M. Luxton's a great guy, you should follow him. I'll list these, uh, uh, maybe I'll tweet them out. Uh, but they've been retweeting links about this seminar, and they've been tweeting me and saying, how are the slides coming along? And it's a very jovial community, and it's a good community to join if you want to learn about uh, this kind of stuff. So. Uh, that's it, and over to you, Sean.
All right, thanks, Chuck. That was a great presentation. Uh, a lot of good points. So I'm going to share my slides now in just a second. All right, so uh, we're FormFast, and I'm here to talk a little bit about how FormFast fits into all those things that Chuck just talked about. Um, one of the slides that, that Chuck had presented was that where is healthcare? Healthcare is coming. It's, it's getting better. And that's what we believe as well. This is our maturity model around hospitals and where they're at. Uh, you know, with a name like FormFast, we do have a, a little bit of a, uh, a background in, in the paper processes, the paper based and the forms processes, but we're beyond that as well. So our maturity model starts with hospitals that are really heavily ingrained in paper processes. A lot is happening. Uh, there's very little automation in that uh, area. And that's the, the stage one, and we get tools along each level of this maturity model to get you out of stage one into stage two where you're paper light, where you have some kind of automation engines working in the background where, um, you know, those processes are no longer entirely on paper or if they are on paper, it's not that people know that they have to grab pre-printed forms and, and create those uh, paper forms uh, themselves based on their own knowledge, but a system is in the background generating that or pushing that process, moving that process forward. And then uh, up towards the top here, the stage three where they're paper free, uh, where you can actually run processes that are 100% without paper. So uh, I think in healthcare a lot of times people are talking about paperless and paper free. Uh, just as a one way of talking about we're using our computers more than, than we're using a paper file folder. And our computers and the software on our computers is helping us manage our processes better. Uh, and that's where we're helping hospitals today is uh, taking processes that either were not managed at all or processes that were managed through paper uh, forms and processes um, and human knowledge and, and encapsulating that and using that in an automation manner. So rather than using paper or um, printouts, you can actually use all of these new tools that we have. We have electronic medical records, we have imaging systems, we have uh, workflow automation systems um, in our hospital. So now we can just start combining those and leveraging those to be a paper-free environment. So our tool sets apply to each step along that way, whether you're at that bottom stage that you're using a lot of uh, forms to do your processes, or you're moving into an EMR, you're trying to uh, start to leverage that, you're, you're moving more things digital, or if you're at the top of that scale and you're really striving to be um, the most automated you can be using and leveraging technology. So our tool set runs that gamut. And this slide shows that our tool set really evolves around workflow, whether that's data workflow, information workflow, content workflow, or even human workflow. Um, we have solutions that target different areas of all of that. So uh, forms on demand, um, content management. Once you've uh, created and used these templates or entered data into a system, turning it into information and then managing that information as content. Um, output management, being able to take uh, information or data, turn it into information, turn it into content, and determine where it should be output or who it goes to next, the workflow behind that. And a big part of this is electronic signature. That's kind of a, a hurdle for many organizations to get away from paper. Uh, it's the fact that they have signatures. Their patients have to sign a lot of, uh, of documentation um, at various points in the organization. So our electronic signature product is another point where we're helping hospitals eliminate those manual processes and generating um, those signature forms that need to be uh, generated per patient demographics um, for that visit. So let's start by talking about our process automation with, with the workflow automation and taking typically traditionally paper-based processes 
and turning those into PC-based uh, processes or you know, electronic processes, taking forms that you're using today, maybe a request, an approval, maybe it's going into a you know inter-office envelope and it's being routed based on somebody's written down some steps on the outside of that envelope. Take that and basically allow you to turn that into an automated on-demand workflow and let the system handle the routing and understand where things need to go and what the business rule behind that is. So rather than saying a person needs to remember to send this to the next step and what that next step is, our product will have those business rules in the background. You saw those workflow charts uh, Chuck showed. Our product is, is basically having that information in the background, those process rules, and it's evaluating the documentation as it's, as it's being entered um, and, and can determine where to send information um, through that route. So you have control over where things go as an administrator, as a process improvement expert. Um, you have control over those processes. It also gives you the ability to track where things are at throughout that process. One of the big time wasters in organizations is tracking things down. So you've made a request, you're looking for uh, you know, paperwork that, that you filled out and sent in. Maybe it has five or ten steps to go through before it gets approved, but you have no idea of that until uh, you know, it lands back on your desk as either approved or denied. With, uh, with an automated system, you can look into the process and find out where that's at uh, and what's happening with it. This is an example just of a, uh, you know, give you a visual of uh, a workflow for purchase requisition. So we all kind of can understand what it would take to uh, request the purchase of something. You know, you fill out a form and you determine where it goes uh, as far as, you know, does your uh, manager need to approve it? Does a vice president need to approve it? Does it go to purchasing? Well, we would let you define those rules one time in the workflow engine and then every time that document is started electronically, those rules are triggered. So in this case, uh, it's starting out with a requester going to a, maybe a department head and then we look at the, the values on the, on the document to determine if that's a, over a certain value amount. Would it need to go to a vice president for approval or not, if it does or if it doesn't? So basically on the, on the document you can see FormPass has access to every bit of information on this document so we can see that the you know, value of this purchase request is uh, you know, eight, it's over that $10,000 mark so it's going to route it to that vice president. So part of what we have is access to a plethora of data on these documents. That's something that you don't have when you're filling out paper forms. Um, that is trapped in the silo of paper. It, you stick it in that envelope, it goes away. Somebody has to look at that, read it. If you want it into a computer, somebody has to key that back into the computer. We're eliminating that. You fill out that form online or pull information in from other data sources onto that document and push it through this workflow. We know everything about that. And so that leads into the next step of the workflow of workflows is the improvement of your workflow. So because we have so much data managed in our system, we understand um, everything on that form and we track that, we can give you reports back that show you um, what's happening on those documents, so the actual content of those, of those documents. In this case, maybe there's purchase requests. You can look at the information on those purchase requests to um, total it up by vendor and find out information about that. So that's an example of content on the form there's also the process information. So how long does it take to complete this? How long do my steps take? Uh, what steps are my bottlenecks? Um, that kind of information is also available. So now you can start that meta workflow of, of, of improving your processes because we're collecting and gathering and, and displaying this data back to you. So, as, a, as, a, as an information manager in your organization or as a process owner in your organization, we put all of that at your fingertips through what we call a workflow uh, application. And that gives you a grouping of processes that are happening that are related to you. And then you would have oversight over that. Maybe you may not touch every document that is going through this process, but you'd be able to see 
everything that's happening. You'd be able to see if there are stalls and if there are bottlenecks. You'd be able to have access to the reports about that process. So one of the um, you know, slides that Chuck was talking about was how do you determine where to start? And one of our organizations, one of, the, one of our customers has started in a medical record review. That was a very high volume transaction, many transactions in their organization that they needed to automate with this tool. Um, you know, they had to, in different departments, review five medical records um, weekly and fill out this form that has about 56 questions on it to uh, evaluate whether or not everything in that record is being filled out. So the way they were doing that in the paper process was they had a long form on a clipboard. They would go through and they'd fill that out one time and then they'd fill it out again for another record, five records in total. And then they would send that to um, a, an aide in the uh, process improvement department and that A would actually go through those records and key that into a spreadsheet so that they could come up with a total and a compliance percentage uh, for each of those five and then multiply that times each department that had to fill this out. Uh, so we're looking at a time span of, of weeks to get this one report done uh, and this of course then had to be aggregated across all departments into one final report. So it was a very manual process to do that. So they took that form, turned it into an online form, added things like required fields to this so that uh, even in the paper form there were exceptions because people didn't fill out the entire form or filled it out improperly. So drop down lists, uh, required fields, things like that help to make sure that the data is entered and entered correctly. Uh, it also does calculations on the form. So as this form is being filled out, that compliance number where they used to have to put this into a spreadsheet and then calculate that, that's being filled out and completed in the form itself. And then there's also reporting and analytics uh, around this as well. So once this is filled out, it's in a computer system, the aggregation can happen, the, the reports can be generated uh, and created. The process owner can see in this view, you can see that they're seeing all of the outstanding processes that are happening so they know that these people are filling out a, a report right now so they can see what's coming down the pipe. You can see the reporting that's built on top of this. They're collecting data, able to quickly understand what's happening at different departments in their organization, what the quality levels are. And so this turned it into a real-time solution rather than this long delayed solution um, where the paper process was uh, a lot of manual steps and the computer now does a lot of the, not only the routing and the workflow of it, but the data processing and, and pulling out information for them. So it allows them to enforce that process with those drop down lists um, and the defined, the predefined routing behind it. And so the next step is what happens with these forms once they've been filled out, completed, and, and now it's time to store those. We also have a content management system which gives you basically the electronic filing cabinet for your organization. So all of these forms, rather than storing them in a physical file cabinet that takes up space or shipping them and paying storage off-site, uh, you can have those never be printed go directly into a content management system that is organized and secured so that the people who need access to that information have access to that information without having to request it from somebody or um, go search through a file cabinet for it. You have uh, you know, electronic searching, you have indexing, um, you have security so that it's available only to the people who have the rights to, to see that. Um, and you also have workflow tied into that as well. So, all of our products are feeding into this. You can scan documents into this as well. So it's another method of, of leveraging this content now um, and spreading it across your organization rather than being trapped in paper and not being leveraged. That helps you meet the compliance needs. So when somebody comes in to uh, do a survey on compliance, it's very easy to pull up the paperwork uh, maybe it's, a, it's an HR thing and you need to show orientation records. Uh, if you have this in our content management system, you can very quickly do a query to pull up 
a set of uh, compliance uh, records for orientation or uh, for employee health, whatever it is. It's there at your fingertips rather than having to um, go to a file cabinet and pull several files that way. It's there easy to get to. It, it's going to reduce your, your mistakes, um, uh, misfiling, because a lot of that is going to be filed automatically based on data that comes into the system along with the content. Another place that we have a huge impact in organizations is with the output management. And that's really, uh, you know, being able to take data that's going across your system, turn it into usable, meaningful information and content. So maybe it's a registration stream of, of data coming in when a patient is registered. Being able to look at that data and determine what services that patient is here for, things like their age, their medical uh, insurance status, um, you know, whether they're Medicare customers, um, and then determining what needs to be printed based on all that information or generated and sent into the electronic medical record as an image so that their um, you know, face sheet is into the medical record so that it's available at any time. Generating the electronic consent form so that the electronic signature is captured and put into a medical record so that when they go for, for that service, it's a, it's a mouse click away rather than calling down to a, a records department to find out if it's on record yet. So our output management takes that data that's coming across your organization and makes these decisions and prints or emails or uh, outputs images to various points in your organization. When we do that, we're, we're marrying up the data onto forms if they need to be printed. Uh, we're doing calculations. We're changing and manipulating the data. In this case, we're kind of highlighting that we do a barcoding, which helps you get to your EMR, because if you print a document, when we print a document, we'll print a document identifier and a patient identifier as barcodes. And with those two identifiers, this paper document can be put onto a scanner, scanned into your electronic medical system, and it'll read those two barcodes and know exactly where to put this document. So you don't have to have somebody actually manually scanning and indexing all of your documentation that's been printed and written on. Instead, you can, at the end of the day or end of the cycle, go in and put a stack of papers onto a scanner, let that scan in bulk, and index each one individually automatically without somebody taking care of it. So this is just a way that you know I explained the print management works. You know, a user registers a patient, clicks the, the print button, FormFast receives that information and starts running these business rules, applies that logic and then generates the documents and, and sends it to where it needs to go as in the format it needs to go as well. And then the last thing is electronic signature. I know we're running short on time, so I'll speed through this a little bit. But we have an electronic signature product that leverages the output management. So as we're reading that information, we're understanding that, hey, this person needs to sign a consent form for Medicaid, or they're under 18, so they need a parent to sign a consent form. Generating that every time. So it's not a human knowledge factor that generates that form or pulls that out of a, a, you know, a storage. Um, a, a cubby hole and, and gives that to the patient, the software is driving that interaction, is driving the fact that that was generated and makes it available. So, and integrates with your registration system so that you can do the, the signature capture. You can do the signature capture in a variety of ways and devices, be it at a registration station with a, a hardware solution or at a mobile station where you have an iPad or a uh, to have a PC type of, uh, of hardware where you're moving around and collecting that signature. Because it's server-based, all of these different solutions will work against that. So we generate the document, put it into electronic signature, and then you can retrieve that document from various locations, whatever is closest to the patient, and, and gather that signature. And then that goes into your electronic medical record. It's available uh, throughout the organization in real time. Uh, the forms on demand fits right into that as well. So after a patient has been registered, you can refresh a, a, a packet of uh, patient information or generate new wristbands or generate new 
um, you know, progress notes for a patient just very simply by clicking on a patient name that you're responsible for, selecting any packets that they want uh, generated, and clicking print to generate those. Um, and then you have that availability right on demand without having to call down to registration or call into HIM to get new forms or, or new documents. And it's always 100% correct, 100% legible because the data is coming out of the uh, you know the single source of data, and it's it's not being put on with a label or embossed or handwritten. So it's 100% legible, always accurate, uh, based on your hospital information systems. So that was kind of a quick overview of how FormFast fits into the things that Chuck was talking about. A lot of it is, you know, improving processes, starting where you're at, determining what's going to give you the most value, and then starting the, starting the process of improving those processes. So improving that workflow through that workflow workflow. Uh, so now we're going to open up for questions, and uh, Aaron, I'll, I'll turn it back over to you. Thanks, Sean. Great presentation to, to both of you. Like Sean said, we're going to open up for questions now. We've had a few come in during the presentations. Uh, the first one I'm going to direct to Chuck, and it is, who needs to be the champion of workflow? Is it the physician, the nurse, administration, IT? What's your thought? Well, um, I, my, uh, my thought is, you know, often uh, when folks want to um, implement an electronic health record, they you know they say, well, we need a champion, and uh, and so you know that, that internal champion. Uh, you know, I'm not even sure that the idea of a, ch of a of a workflow champion necessarily makes sense to me. I think that if you give people the tools to improve the workflow around them, they will tend to want to do it especially if you can demonstrate to them. So I guess you do need a champion for that sort of first, uh, you know, the, the high value. Whoever owns the high value, uh, low complexity workflow, that's the champion. Uh, in fact, I didn't show all of the dimensions. There's actually about three or four dimensions to both value and complexity. And one of the values, uh, one of the dimensions was, had to do with executive sponsorship uh, and or uh, a champion. So uh, uh, there you, uh, it's a little bit like looking for your keys under the, uh, the lamp, uh, uh, light post, because that's where you can see. So yeah, uh, it, so uh, as you do, as you scan the environment, you're gonna, one of the three or four or five uh, things that will determine whether a workflow is a high value workflow or not is whether there's a natural champion who can uh, to help shepherd. So it's going to it's going to be uh, on a case by case basis. Great. And as a follow up to that, are there specific examples of those high value low, low complexity workflows that you can think of as low hanging fruits in the hospital? Uh, well, I'm going to actually, uh, uh, be, it, it tends to be very, very, uh, you know, sort of domain specific. You know, you were talking about the medical records department. Are we talking about, you know, ambulatory? Are we talking about, you know, uh, 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 managing uh, some kind of process in the executive suite? Uh, so probably uh, good specific examples. Uh, in this case, uh, Sean might be the best uh, uh, source. Yeah, we typically talk with our customers, uh, um, you know, about their high volume forms, and there are a lot of things that aren't that complex, um, and a lot of them, a lot of the processes don't have um, a definition around them today, even. So things like employee onboarding and all the things that are spurred around that, um, you know, requesting access to systems from IT, uh, requesting security. Uh, badges and clearances from the security department. So as you onboard a, an employee, those are simple processes, but maybe you don't have full control over those. And then kind of the, the other side of this too is, what's the impact of not having full control over these processes? So when that employee terminates, do you know what systems they have access to? Do you know what security passes they have on them? Do you know what equipment has been issued to them? So being able to take those processes from the simple aspect of, geez, we just hired somebody, they need these these items, um, and then turning that into, now we have an inventory of what every employee has, and extending it 
because now we can leverage technology rather than um, you know trap knowledge to do that. Another high volume application that a lot of our customers are using are, are employee change orders. So when they uh, transfer from department to department or change a, uh, a rate or hours, those are, are very high volume uh, transactions in those processes, uh, especially in some of the larger organizations. There, there are a lot of employees to deal with. Uh, there are all kinds of processes that can be automated. And of course, the number one process would be admissions, you know, generating the right content at the time of admissions and making sure you get that right so that it, patient care flows properly and so that billing flows properly. It affects a lot of things, uh, getting that right, getting signatures in place. So that's one of the you know, core processes of automation that, that's a low-hanging fruit as well. Great. Uh, another question that we got via the chat um, uh, states, uh, how would you manage the quote-unquote, but we're special pushback most BPM theory gets from clinical care teams? Chuck, do you, do you see that type of uh, pushback? Um, uh, uh, I, yeah. Yes, I do. And um, I, I think, uh, and, and again, you know, you only have enough time to cover what you can cover, and I think I was pretty organized and spoke pretty quickly. Uh, but if you go back to, I think, my, can you put me back on the first slide, or on my slides? Sure thing. Just one moment. <clears throat> and, uh, yes, okay, so I'm going to go back to, uh, I said I wasn't going to be boring, but here I guess I will. Uh, okay. Uh, with with uh, What slide are you on, Chuck? I'm on slide uh, eight. Okay. Do you see do do you, do you see it? Yeah, we're seeing that now. Okay. Uh the uh fifth one down, uh, adaptive case management, uh, global excellence awards. I'm actually a, a judge on that. Um within the business process management community. And forget, you know, you saw the quote from uh Will Van Rels in which he said that healthcare is more chaotic uh and more unstructured. Uh within the business process management community, there has been a similar reaction to overly rigid uh, process models, uh, and and part of the um, uh, I don't know the tribe of uh, of, of uh, rebels uh, they uh, call them they're into something they call adaptive case management. Adaptive case management, and these systems they come out of the business process management community, but they uh, they very much uh, diminish an, an emphasis on. That you know that network diagram that says this has to happen and this has to happen. In fact, what they do is they represent very high-level goals. Like this case is 25% done, or we have obtained the signature. It doesn't say how to get the signature. Anybody can get the signature, but what they do emphasize is visibility. Visibility. Here are the set of goals. Anybody can accomplish it based on certain constraints. I mean, you have to have the authority and so forth. And then everybody sees as the case moves along, what's being accomplished, and then people jump in more dynamically. Uh, so it, what, they, what these systems emphasize and represent is what needs to be done, not how it needs to be done. And so there are some very interesting uh, adaptive case management systems that I think would be great in some of the more, well, they'd be great to show to those folks uh, who look at a traditional BPM uh, system and look at that workflow and say, well, we we don't we we can't imagine ourselves fitting ourselves into such a rigid, uh, structured workflow. Perfect. And a question from Vince, who, who uh, notes your presentation seems to focus mostly on workflow within organizations, and he notes that he agrees about a lot of challenges and opportunities there. Uh, he'd also like for you to comment on the similarities <clears throat> and differences of BPN uh, within organizations versus across organizations. Okay, uh, and I, I yes. Um, I've, uh, I'm interested in uh, workflow across organizations. And there, there are interesting, uh, in fact, uh, uh, integration engines and interface engines that will allow uh, various kinds of messages to be passed through or, uh, from organization to organization have a lot of business process management-like qualities. And a lot of BPM engines also have adapters that allow them to 
uh, to transform and, and, and transport messages. So there's a kind of a, there's actually a lot of overlap. I focus kind of on the workflow within the organization, partly because I don't think you can have great workflow between organizations if the organizations themselves don't have great workflow inside. I don't think you can build a strong bridge out of uh, mediocre materials. That's just a personal uh, axe I have to grind. Uh, but there are uh, lots of orchestration engines out there in healthcare that have business process management-like characteristics. Uh, and so I do see a kind of a great uh, convergence of, uh, you know, rose by any other name, as long as it models the process and whether it's inside the organization or outside the organization, if, it's, if it provides transparency, scalability, flexibility, uh, that's great. Segwaying uh, on the topic of integration, <clears throat> Matthew would like to, to know, how do we use this in inpatient flow management when the applications like ER systems, bed management systems, and utilization management systems are all unintegrated? Yeah, uh, I'm very sympathetic to that. Uh, I mean, I've, I've worked in a hospital MIS department, and uh, we did an environmental scan, and we ended up with, uh, I don't know, several hundred information systems, and this was uh, 20 years ago. Uh, and none of them talk to any of them. And now some of them talk to each other. Uh, I guess there's some progress there. Uh, that's, I, I, think, uh, I, I, I think that one of the um, uh, measures of complexity in ranking workflows was how many systems does it touch or need to integrate with. And uh, if it needs to, to integrate with a bunch of systems or it needs to integrate with a system that you cannot integrate with, that makes it uh, highly complex. And I think you need to start with the workflows that can be successful. Because if they're successful and people understand the benefits of a process-aware philosophy and of using workflow engines and so forth, then that's going to put pressure to, uh, to open up other systems so they can participate in this larger uh, workflow highway that's being created. That's, I know that doesn't really address... Uh, a, a, a particular system, uh, but it does give you a route forward to sort of bring, uh, to strategically bring in uh, more true workflow automation into a, a hospital environment. Okay, and Casey uh, comments that uh, lean was a big topic of discussion at the recent HM13 conference. She wants to know if you see lean as a good first pass for healthcare entities looking to explore BPM. I th when I look at, uh, you know, the old days, TQM, Six Sigma, uh, finding errors and uh, eliminating variability and lean particularly. In fact, I have a link on, on one. I used to give a three-hour tutorial on workflow automation in healthcare at the old Tepper conference, which is gone. I did that in the... Uh, for three or four years running, and I have a, and I have a, a blog. I turn those into blog posts. I actually have a blog post. Uh, uh, if you'll uh, leave me a comment or contact me through the contact form, in which I, I, I talk about non-value added versus value added activities in a workflow automation context. And I think that if you marry, if you give the lean uh, professionals and the Six Sigma professionals, you give them the kind of plastic, instrumented, malleable healthcare workflow information management tools, I think you're going to turbocharge and, and, and uh, give uh, a great deal of help to those lean and Six Sigma activities. In fact, the, the, the BPM professionals, they don't necessarily know the healthcare domain that well. They, and, 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 and a very nice marriage of, 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 of healthcare domain content expertise is the, is the lean and Six Sigma health professional uh, in, in conjoined with these tools that increasingly mediate uh, uh, information flow and therefore work. Perfect. And I realize that we are a bit uh, over time uh, today, so that will uh, conclude the question and answer portion of the session. If we didn't get to your question, we'll reach out to you individually offline and uh, answer your question then. And I'd like to thank like everybody to... who attended, but especially everybody who I interact with on Twitter. And if you're not on Twitter, come and get the, and, and interact because it's a fun community and a great way to learn about this stuff. And I'd like to thank our featured speaker, uh, Dr. Charles Webster, for, uh, for uh, sharing his thoughts on workflow. Thanks, Chuck, for uh, pre presenting today. Have a great day, everybody. And thanks to Sean Curtis as well for taking the time out of his schedule to join us.
Uh, we hope that this session has been educational and has also inspired you to learn more about using workflow in your hospital. If that's the case, we'd like to hear from you. You'll be presented with a response page at the conclusion of this event. Simply click on the button on the screen to schedule a consultation with us and make sure to register for the next web event as well. The next web session will actually be our 2013 user group meeting at the end of June. We'll be, fe be featuring customer success stories, new product and feature announcements, tips and tricks for better using our solutions and, and more. The virtual conference will be divided into to two days and you can register for that on the uh, response page or by visiting www.formfast.com slash, slash UGM for user group meeting. Thank you for attending today's webinar and we'll see you at the user group meeting at the end of June.